One of my favorite things about each chapter in Dead by Daylight is the relationship that the killer and survivor have on it. For example, the most recent case is the knight and Vittorio Toscano. And did you know that they knew each other? In fact, Vittorio hired the knight for help and the knight wanted to kill Vittorio only for both of them to disappear around the same time. But this is a specific case as not all survivors and killers share backgrounds. In the case of Jane Romero and the plague, they are not even from the same century and live in completely different countries. But what if I told you that they have a lot of things in common, more than meets the eye? Let's take a look at each original DLC and explain the common themes or backgrounds that the characters have with each other. Let's start with Nia and Nurse. Despite being the oldest DLC, not a lot of the community knows the connections these two characters have, as they share a common theme, change. In Nia's case, she had a happy childhood in a small town in Sweden, and she felt good until her parents decided to move to the US, where she started acting out, and she became the troublemaker she is now. For the nurse, she had an amazing peaceful life with her husband Andrew, but that suddenly changed when he died and she had to find a job in the asylum, changing her life completely to the worst. But a common theme is not the only thing this DLC has between the characters, as Nia Carlson ended up living in the same or close to the area where the nurse lived, as before being taken by the entity, Nia was there to tag the Crotus Pren Asylum, which by that time was already completely abandoned, and based on her lore, she was probably also captured there by the entity. When you think of Ace and Hag, you can see that on the surface they are completely different characters, they never met each other before being taken by the entity, they didn't live in the same place at all. And if I made this video back in 2019, then that would still be the case as they had no connection at all. That was until the Tome 4 that was released in 2020, which showed that these two characters have a very common theme, luck. In the case of Ace Visconti, we already knew that he was a gambler that lost a lot of money, was always in debt, but he still played and he still got somehow lucky in order to continue his life. That is, of course, until his luck ran out and now he ended up being full of debt and trapped in the entity's realm forever. Now, as for the hag, have you ever wondered where she learned the magic hexes from? Well, that's something that her grandmother teach her, and the hex she used the most is a fortune one. But of course, she started abusing the fortune charms and using them in meaningless things like passing exams, and this luck had to be repaid some way, and it's not exaggerated to say that the hack had one of the most torturous backstories by far out of all the killers in Dead by Daylight. So in the end, both Ace and the Hag's luck ran out. The Doctor and Feng Min are a very unique case out of all the chapters we have in this video, and I believe this topic requires its own video, so if you're enjoying this so far, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on a future video essay talking about the Doctor's original design and lore that I am sure will shock you. <laughs> As of what we ended up getting, I believe the current <laughs> connections these two characters have is that they are obsessed with something. In the case of Feng Min, she's obsessed with video games and esports. As for the doctor, he's obsessed with knowledge and experimenting with human victims. Still, don't miss out on the doctor's video as I am positive <laughs> you will like it. Out of all the chapters in this vid, the Huntress and David are the least connected to each other. David never met the Huntress, they don't live in the same country, and they are from different ages, so the only connection they could have is a theme. And while there is a theme that fits both, I still feel like it's a reach. That theme is society. The Huntress was completely outcasted of society as she lived and learned as a savage hunter in the forests. She had no social skills and the only unnatural feeling for her is the need to take care of little girls, so she straight up steals them from villages, but no matter what she does, 
she cannot be a normal mother. On the case of David King, it is a little bit more complicated. But David's life was not as simple. He was born from a wealthy family, yet he ended up doing brawls and fights anytime he could. And in Tome 11, we know that David King had a complicated life because he was not straight, which made things for him even more complicated than they already were. Both of the characters have suffered from tragedy, but they still have the feeling of love in their hearts. Kate and the Clown marked a very important step in Dead by Daylight's success, as with this chapter began a new era. But this video is about the connection between the two characters, and they have two themes in common, entertainment and travel. Both characters are performers who traveled all across America in order to share their crafts. In the case of Kate, she composed a lot of songs with the purpose of spreading joy to her fans and listeners. In the case of Clown, however, and while he did have a job as a clown and he did travel around America, he did it for his own personal joy of capturing innocent people and cutting their fingers by using that entertainment facade. So in a way, they are complete opposites like yin and yang. The connection between these two is more interesting than the previous ones as it's a mix of both theme and a bit of backstory, just like Nia and Nurse. Adam was born in Jamaica and his dad passed away in a car accident very early, so he had to live with his uncle. However, his uncle was a good man who helped Adam become the man he is now. During his college years, he discovered that he wanted to start his life somewhere else, so he chose Japan, in specific Kagoshima. As for the spirit, she was born in Kagawa and had a complicated life due to her father becoming worse and worse with debts, to the point he snapped and killed both the spirit and her mother. So we have a location connection as both characters are very connected to Japan and Japanese culture. But most importantly, both characters have the family theme in common. But just like Kate and the clown, they are complete opposites and Adam's uncle was good, whereas Spirit's father was a complete monster. It's interesting to note that in another universe, Spirit could have been just as good as Adam and if they knew each other in real life, they would have been great friends, since the Spirit was a good student. This chapter was the first of its kind, as unlike the rest of the chapters we talked about where the connection was a theme or they lived in the same country or place, the Legion and Jeff directly met each other and they lived in the same town, Ormond. When Frank, Julie, Susie and Joey started the Legion gang, they were tasked to come up with a cool logo design. As we can see on the Susie's notebook charm, she tried to paint some designs, but none of them came right. Jeff was working in Ormond in a video store when one day, a member of what will become the Legion came to the store and noticed on Jeff's notebook that he had a lot of cool sketches and designs, so they were interested and commissioned Jeff with a pack of beers and a $50 bill to create and paint a logo for the Legion. And this mural can be found in the abandoned ski resort. In fact, there is a survivor charm called Legion's Mural because the original designer for it was Jeff Johansen, and another very cool thing about them is that the Legion has an add-on called Stolen Sketchbook, and this sketchbook belongs to Jeff, so they stole it from him before they were taken by the entity. Imagine being Jeff and be chased by those same teenagers for which you created their original logo. And it's sad for the Legion too, because they had no reason to kill Jeff, but now that they are in the entity's realm, there is no other choice. The Plague and Jane Romero did not live in the same country and they are centuries away from each other in time. So on the surface, this chapter looks like two random choices, as what does a Babylonian priestess have in common with a TV host? Well, they are both basically the same but on different times. Jane Romero is a very influential personality with a lot of fans all looking up to her. She is famous and to some people, She's also a charismatic leader, 
someone that preaches her own views. Now, on the other hand, Babylonians didn't have TV or Twitch, instead they had God, and the plague was a very influential personality with a lot of followers looking up to her. She was famous and to some people, she's also a charismatic leader, someone that preaches the word of God. Both of them also suffered during their careers, as Jane was getting exhausted with the amount of pressure her success gave her, and in the case of the plague, she wanted to find a cure to the disease that was killing her and her community, and she had a lot of pressure to save them, to pray more, to sacrifice more. In the end, her only solution was to ask for help to what she thought was another Babylonian god who ends up being the entity. I think the name already gives a pretty clear theme that Yui Kimura, a futuristic motorist, has in common with a brutal samurai from feudal Japan. Japanese are very traditional people, and the Oni is the best example of it as he wanted to honor the name of his family, the Yamaokas, by killing every single fake samurai in the country. No peasant deserved to impersonate samurais because that would stain the reputation and elite status that they had, but this brutality led to people calling him an Oni, in specific a Oni Yamaoka, which made him extremely mad that people were insulting his family honor like that. This pursuit of honor ended up becoming the Oni's demise, because he ended up killing his own father and staining his legacy forever, now being known as a dark legend of Oni Yamaoka. Yui on the other hand wanted to steer away from her tradition. She loved motorcycles, but her parents thought that was a manly activity and she had to do something that women do, like Mary. Her parents had a lot of shame due to Yui's actions and she was no longer welcome in their home. But her life turned out to the better because she did end up pursuing her dreams and she ended up having a gang called the Sakura 7 and she had a lot of respect in the niche she worked on. So just like the clown and Kate, Yui Kimura and the Oni are direct opposites. Oni pursued tradition while Yui left it, but Oni ended up having his legacy ruined whereas Yui left a very positive legacy. And another very interesting link is of course the fact that the Oni and the spirit are direct relatives and this was the first ever case of a chapter that had a connection with a past DLC. This is another chapter that I really like due to it being very unique. On first glance, a cowboy from the 19th century and a present day reporter and filmmaker from Brooklyn have nothing in common, but they share a common theme and also Zarina knew about the dead singer. Let me explain. During Zarina's career as a journalist, she made a successful story related to a criminal and for that reason, some inmates from a prison started to contact her in order for her to make a documentary about them. Out of all the stories they told, one stood out, a sealed shot wing in the Hellshire Penitentiary due to an incident called the Mad Meek Massacre, which according to the story, an Irish outlaw slaughtered the warden and his guards. Well, this guy is dead singer, and he was the Irish outlaw that slaughtered Bayshore. In fact, while Zarina was exploring the hidden cell, she found death to Bayshore engraved on the walls, which is the same motto that Dead Singer has in his own weapon. And if you are curious to know more, check out my fun facts about Dead Singer video because he has a lot of cool things that you didn't know. Anyways, that's not the only connection they both have, as they share a common theme. Discrimination. Zarina suffered from her discrimination due to her Lebanese heritage and she even changed her name to Karina, dyed her hair and even threw away her lunch because it was Lebanese food. For that singer, he was Irish and let me tell you back in the wild west, Irish suffered from a lot of discrimination as they were deemed inferior to Americans. If you want to know more about this, google it because it's a very long historical topic. So they both suffered discrimination, but each of them took a different approach towards fighting it.
I personally don't think that these two characters have a specific theme in common, nor Felix never met Blight in real life as they lived in different countries and in different time periods, but the connection these characters have is a more meta one, based on their impact on the lore of Dead by Daylight, as they were the very first characters that revealed a lot of important lore for the universe of the game. Blight was proof that survivors can roam around the entity's realm, that there is a void where survivors and killers go once they are not useful, and that survivors can end up becoming killers with enough time and with certain conditions. Felix, on the other hand, confirmed that there are people in the world outside of the entity's realm that knew about its existence. It confirmed the lore of the Black Veil and the Farias, which was an occult group of five families with connections to the entity, and these new lore drops gave a lot of insight about the game. But if this was not satisfying for you, then there is a theme that connects both the Blight and Felix, and that is ambition. Blight was obsessed with his research, with alchemy, and with the effects it caused on people. He later was obsessed with the Pustula Flowers, which ended up making him become the blighted creature he is now. For Felix, he was always obsessed with uncovering the mystery of how his father disappeared back in the island where the Farias did whatever sect thing they were doing, and in fact, this same obsession led him to leave his wife and children behind, as he chased the illusion that the entity created of his father. In fact, the name of the DLC, The Send Beyond, is something both did, which led them being captured. The Binding of Kin continues the Faria story with Elodie Bakoto, so this is the second case of a chapter being connected to a past DLC, with the first case being Oni and Spirit. Elodie was on that same island where Felix's father disappeared, and she also wanted to uncover the mystery of this group, so she became a treasure and artifact hunter thanks to the amount of money she had and the easy access to be able to travel all around the world. Both Felix and her are very rich characters, possibly even the richest characters in Dead by Daylight, so they are very interesting survivors considering their backstory, and the fact that two chapters in a row are connected is really cool and unique. Oh wait, I, I completely forgot, the twins was also included on this chapter. So... Oh that's right, I believe Elodie was searching for the school of the mother of two conjoined twins that was burned alive due to her being convicted as a witch, so in a way, Elodie knew about the twin's existence, but if you want a theme connection, then we can say that both characters' motivations were their family. In the case of Elodie, it was her parents, and in the case of twins, it was their mother and the bond they had as siblings. After a long time with no chapters that had a canon lore connection like the Legion and Jeff, All Kill arrived out of nowhere, bringing us two characters that literally worked together. That is the case for the Trickster, a K-pop superstar that started to commit crimes using his facade as a singer, and Yoon Jin, his producer who shot Trickster straight to stardom. Never before have two characters been so connected as they are, and in fact, they were taken at the same time, in the same place. They are the only characters that have talked in the past and we have a conversation recorded, they are the only characters that have cosmetics related to each other, and they are the only duo where the survivor was the direct cause for the killer, as Yoon Jin was who made Trickster famous. Yoon Jin was the one that covered his crimes in order to stay on top of the game, and due to that mistake, she has to be chased in the entity's realm by that same person that she defended. This chapter's connection is very curious. In my personal opinion, these characters don't have a specific theme in which both fit, but instead, their connections is more direct. It would be very long to explain, but both the artist and Jonah were influenced by the entity since they were little kids. Both artist and Jonah have a very long lore, but they both ended up being taken by the entity in the exact same coordinates located in a desert graveyard in Chile where the artist was kidnapped by the cartel in order to be tortured. 
But why Jonah went there? That is because the entity wanted Jonah there. The entity gave him a set of numbers that lead to these coordinates in Chile. And then when Jonah went to investigate, he disappeared completely. The artist and Jonah have a very complex relationship because it also combines political events that happened in real life. So I believe this is a topic that needs its own video. The Dredge and Hadi have a very curious relationship. In fact, I would say Dredge is a very interesting killer because you would assume that since it's a monster and not a human being, there would be no connections whatsoever between Hadi or anyone else. However, that is far from the case. First of all, Hadi has a paranormal power that allows her to feel dark energy in places that she calls the overlaps, which would be in any place where bad events happen. Out of all of them, one of the places she investigated was the island of Garden of Joy, the same island that manifested the dredge due to their dark emotions. So Hadi already could sense the dredge before coming to the entity's realm. But what is very curious is that the dredge has various add-ons that instead of being related to the Garden of Joy and the sect inside, they are directly connected to Hadi, like Hadi's calendar, the air freshener, the war helmet, the lavalier mic, and the field recorder. And this is the only case besides the previously mentioned Stoll sketchbook where a killer has an add-on that references another survivor. In fact, not even Trickster has an add-on that is connected to Yunjin. So the fact that Dredge has various add-ons that have nothing to do with it is very curious. But what is even more curious is the fact that Dredge has no lore that is connected directly to the nature of the monster. But instead, it tells the story of the Garden of Joy sect that was leaded by Otto Stamper. For most, this name doesn't ring a bell at all. But Otto Stamper was the doctor's mentor in the past, and the doctor ended up killing and torturing him. So in a way, you can connect the dredge with the doctor, and it's very possible that the doctor knows about the existence of the dredge, but this is not confirmed anywhere in the lore. And the last DLC we have is Forged in Fog, which includes Vittorio Toscano and the Knight. If you watch my videos, then you would most likely know the connection these two have. But if you don't, then make sure to click on this fun facts video about them, where I explain their connection and hidden details like shirtless Vittorio that I am sure you don't want to miss out. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.